Good afternoon, planet Earth, and welcome to this corner of the planet, a really special corner of the planet for those of us living here. This is Juma Game Reserve in South Africa, and my name is Mark. Herman is with me on camera this afternoon, and Afka is doing her directing debut today, although I think Afka spent a bit of time, enough time in the director's chair back in Final Control to know what's going on. And we've watching a herd of impala and while we were watching this herd of impala we had an african harrier hawk coming over it was gliding in on the thermals barely flapping a wing some of the birds around us are shouting alarms and it seems to have landed just over the rise of this open area that we're sitting on I'm not sure we're going to see it we've had a, a juvenile african harrier hawk visiting regularly over the past few months but it's been quite a while since we've had an adult and very striking grey, black and white markings with yellow legs and the yellow beak, yellow sear of the adult. And, well, we could go and look for it and see if we can pick it up again. Just a lovely, peaceful afternoon with the Impala. Some of them are grazing. I can see a couple aloe grooming, grooming each other. Very interesting when they're grooming. Sort of one does a little bit of licking and grooming and it sort of waits for the other one to reciprocate. We've got a young male and an adult female. I don't know if you've got them, Herman. Just here. In front or in yeah, shadow? here in the front, in the shadow. A very young male that was one of the late lambs, considering the size of his horns and also the size of his body. He was probably born very, very late in maybe January or so, or even February. And that's possibly his mother with an oxpecker on her neck. And she's, looks like she's asking for a little bit more grooming than he is willing to give. He waits for her. You should count how many times they lick each other. It's not so much licking as much as it is actually grooming with their lower incisors. And one of these days, um, if I'm lucky enough to find the lower jaw of an impala, sort of post leopard kill or, or post something kill, I'll be able to show you the grooves in the teeth of the lower incisors of impala that almost act as combs to help comb out the fur, to help comb parasites out of the hair. As you can see with movement of the trees, a little bit breezy today. Not sure what to call it on the Beaufort scale. But uh, gusts that are fairly strong and then just a general a general breeze blowing through every now and then stronger gusts of wind there's a family of magpie shrikes or long-tailed shrikes around here too we could hear them quite clearly but I don't see them now mission today well little birdie told me about some elephants at Wadgari Dam earlier so I'm thinking maybe we should go and find some pachyderms. I need an elephant fix. I haven't seen Ellie's for a while. I need I need some of that relaxing uh, what could I call it? Grounding soul-searching feeling that being with elephant brings. Shall we go? And while we're driving, I encourage you to send in emails. You can send in questions, comments, and that will be to finalcontrol at safari.tv. We'll start in the middle of the property, we'll do a little bit of a 
couple of loops around the middle end and then maybe make our way towards Gary Cutline other side of the dam I don't want to go there too early there are possibly guests in the lodge have to wait until the lodge finishes their high tea and heads out on drive before we can make an appearance on that side of things interesting that the sticks were here last night and even more interesting that they managed to link up with that little girl that was lost it was probably what all the roaring was about to try and locate her and then she came trotting across the dam wall and although it wasn't very clear for those of us that were watching you could see how they all got up and also, there were six of them that were lying there and they all got up and surrounded her and eventually when they finally did make it to walk to waking up and heading on across the dam wall and came directly in front of the camera or down to the camera and I managed to just get that one moment of getting rather close up on that little girl that little female so luckily she's back with the pride I know what her outlook is the prognosis is Herman's just sorting something out with the antenna. In the meantime. Just looking straight down the road, we're looking down towards Philemon's cut Philemon's dip and Philemon's cut line. And I don't know when it was, when it was just suddenly wintry from when it was green. We've been seeing a gradual change, but for those of us that live here, the daily changes are somewhat subtle. And then all of a sudden now, for example, when I can see one of the main power line poles on Gary Main, which I haven't noticed before, ever, since I've been here. And that's on the ridge, right in the distance. One green tree, that's probably a jackalberry. Jackalberries will hold on to their leaves for some time still. They lose leaves when the new ones are coming out, so it's a very short period of change. It's not like it's a whole season that jackalberries will be losing leaves and then getting new ones. Like all these combretums and the, the, the bush willows. Those are the trees that we see the most change out of at the moment because they're going through yellows and browns. The marulas, one day they've got leaves and the next day, well maybe not that quick, but it's almost that fast. But they don't really go yellow. The marulas just go sort of a pale green and then they just start falling. And you turn around and look at a marula the next day and suddenly it's leafless. But the combretums, it's a slow process. All these bush willows are slowly turning yellows and browns. That's what I've got an orange shirt on for today, a bit of camouflage. Hmm. Autumn colour camouflage, even if it's a week away from midwinter. Ellie in Maine is a young lioness that's just been reunited with the sticks. Is she looking any healthier than she was a few weeks ago? Ellie, no. She's actually, if you didn't get to see her from our drive a few days ago, I need a quarry branch, sorry. But the remnants of this big herd of buffalo that have been here, and with all the buffalo dung lying around, got these tiny little really irritating flies. And I know I love insects, and I, I love all life, but 
these tiny little flies that get into your eyes and up your nose and into the mouth. They have me swatting my own face all day. I need a little worry branch to just keep them away. And there I'm a poet again. Although I have been told so I do know it. Ellie, she was looking rather sad a couple of days ago. She has a suppurating wound on her face that isn't very good. Um, it is pussing like it is probably as a result of TB. I don't even think that one would need to do a TB test on her, but these lions have fed on buffalo and the buffalo are all carriers of bovine TB. And while it may not manifest in most of them, it may not affect them, sometimes it does and sometimes not. Sometimes it does affect them and her condition doesn't help her. She's already got a depleted immune system and, and she's already weakened by what appears to be sarcoptic mange. That'll do. A little fly switch if you want. We just killed one. Okay, call in the fly police. We have a dead fly on our hands, we need the crime squad. Quarry. Yes, because I can be, pretend to be a Sangoma as well. No, I can't pretend that the ancestors would get angry. The ancestors would get very angry. Um, just to let you know, the reason why I chose this particular branch as a bit of a fly swish is because the leaves are very, very hardy hard and leathery and they don't come off very easily so I can spend the rest of the three hours keeping flowers off of my face without trouble. Hi Sharon. We have had this question just on Jared's drive the other day. Is there a way to tell the difference between hippo, male and female, this sexual dimorphism as we call it in nature? Is there any way to, to tell that in hippo other, other than the obvious? Well Sharon, there isn't really an obvious with hippo because one doesn't, even when they're out of the water, one doesn't really see the genitalia. So it's very hard unless you have a dominant male hippo. It's quite a remarkable thing about male hippos is that they continue to grow throughout their lives in, in terms of the broadening of their head and neck. Just by the way, we pointed down towards Chelapan. Yes, let's take my first inclination. So when you have a pod of hippos, you'll find the hippo with the broadest head, the broadest snout, Obviously when they're just doing a threat display and it's the male that's likely to be doing the threat display um, You will see bigger tusks on the bull than you will on the cows Cows are normally sort of Closer together the bull a little bit separate not normally, but sometimes It's actually very difficult. I heard Jared mentioning the other day that the bulls tend to have more darker markings around the face and ears I am. And it just must have been that little girl. Have a look further on. Um, and that the females are more pinkish around the eyes and ears. Um, and then of course you often have females accompanied by youngsters. But it isn't an easy thing. It's certainly not as easy as say elephant which isn't that not necessarily that easy. You 
see how well this works. It's like sitting with a fly swatter in your hand. As soon as you get something, the flies are put it down. I heard a squirrel. Alarming. One rumor we can dispel is the fa is the one that Mr. T had hooked up with the sticks prior. And he wasn't with them last night. So whether he had and has left them, another matter. It was only the young male last night. Turned on to Vulture's Nest Road. Heading towards Central. I think more or less north now. Central Road. Number of hyena tracks in the road that I have from last night. 
there was one little print of a leopard further back obviously not as fresh as fresh enough to follow Thank you. Thanks very much to Paddy Mulligan, New Jersey. Sending in an update from Nkoro. Paddy says that Mr. T is actually with the Talala Pride. Towards I don't know. Is it the west? I don't know what they mean by the west. West of Nkoro, I guess. Not sure, but a pride that we don't get over here, a pride that we don't see at all. But evidently he's doing better, he's doing well. Clifford, good afternoon Clifford, Clifford wants to know if I know how many lions are left in the Kruger, Actually, I don't Clifford, I know Paddy, no sorry, um, Penny, Penny Leg in Durban sent me an update a while ago, I'm sorry but that kind of figure just slipped my mind right now, but the Kruger does keep relatively accurate records of how many lions there are. I don't know, it's probably about 200, I think, if that lion population has been hammered through various diseases. And a strange, I wouldn't say it's a new phenomenon, I just say it's becoming more common now to have these large coalitions of males. I don't recall having large coalitions like we have now 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was enough to have one big male to a pride, maybe two or three at the most. I do recall back in the early 90s seeing a group of seven sub-adult males and they were still youngsters, they were three years old. They would have been through a lot of changes before they became five-year-olds and strong enough to take over proper uh, territory. And since I saw them near my home in the Timbavati and I know of, I don't know of any large coalitions in those days that took over, I don't think anything came of those seven young nomadic males. I do know that there is a coalition up there now that has split up the pride that has the two white lion cubs that were born last year in June. And those two cubs, or well they're yearlings now, those two year old cubs and their sibling and well I think there were two or three siblings, I think there were five in the pride, five in the litter. Three normal coloured and two, two white. Um, Last I heard, and that was a few months ago, that they were down near King's Camp. And King's Camp is managed by the same people that manage Boyatella and Juma Bush Lodge, seasons in Africa. And there's a bit of communication between King's Camp and the people at Boyatella. And my good friend Duncan. I'm heading west again now on Central Road. We're going to go back towards Gari Cut Line and have a look for some of these, some signs of these elephants. A little bit of luck. Holding thumbs, crossing fingers, knock on wood, touch wood. Two doves in the road somewhere, I'm sure. Let's see if we can find some Ellie's this afternoon. I smell them. I smell them already. Oh, we're after doing Mike Moss. Uh, 
Okay. Got more than I thought. Thanks, Mike. According to Penny, in 2009, there were 1,600 lion and cougar. Okay, a lot more than I thought. I don't know why I thought of a number of 200 or something. 200, maybe here in the Sabi Sand. Fairly strong smell of elephant further back. There was more elephant dung than elephant themselves. Could have been elephant dung of theirs earlier before they got to Gari Dam. track on the road. Lovely warm day today so there are snakes about despite being winter. Jared and Kat found a lovely skin this morning. A vine snake. Ellen Get out of this dip. I think I'll go down Gary Cutline for a little bit. Ellen in Illinois. I need to know if we ever see tigers. Not likely, Ellen. Tigers do not occur in Africa. Tigers have been brought to Africa. There is currently a tiger breeding project on a very, very remote farm about 500 miles away. And it's enclosed, and those tigers are not likely to get out of there. But no, other than that, no naturally occurring tigers in Africa, never have been, not likely to be. And that's quite a strange thing because a lot of people who don't really have that much to do with Africa, they don't really have much knowledge of what really occurs in Africa, immediately associate tigers with Africa. And I don't know where that came from because, well, yeah, no tigers in Africa. Tigers are from India and going east into Asia and up into Russia. Somewhere on this block on the left is where the elephants are because they tend they seem to have moved off from Gari Dam, a very typical direction that elephants move in when they leave Gari Dam. I think we'll make a big loop. We're going to lose a little bit of signal towards the end of Gary Cutline going up to up Biffles of Cutline to Mbuba Road. Hopefully we won't be gone for too long. Live in Parlour, Bachelor Boys here. Yeah.
Oh, that's a long question. Long question coming in from Clifford. I don't know if I'm going to have time to answer it by the time we get to a breakup, but I can try. Clifford is ex-South African, living in Norway. That's quite a culture difference, there. Not to mention time and season. Going into summer now, you probably don't have very much darkness. So I wonder where these lion tracks came from. Or rather who, not so much what or where. The lion tracks here. Yeah. Could be the sticks coming into Gary Dam last night. The tracks up and down. Hmm? Must have been them coming into Gary Dam. Clifford, been to Kruger a lot when he was still here. Have we ever seen or caught a poacher in action and what can we do to stop them? I think that's the bulk of the question. Not here in South Africa, Clifford, no. And here in the private reserves that we are least likely to come across poachers than say in areas of Kruger where the public drive around. Hello everyone, this is Afke, Inferno Control. As you can see, we're going to uh, an area with a bad signal. Um, we will be back as soon as um, things pick up again. For now, we can see Gauri Dam with, in the left top corner, um, the drive.
back with us, turning onto Mbubu Road. Haven't found any tracks on Ruffles or Cut Line. So I'm guessing these elephants are still in the block east of Gary Dam, and that's going to make things a little difficult. They were, they were at the dam about three hours ago, which means that they could either be a hundred meters away or they could be anywhere in that block. Been rhino, yeah. And buffalo. Um, still busy with Clifford's question. And that was about poachers and have we ever come across them and what to do when we do. Clifford, I was saying that here in the Sabi Sand, now, personally I've never worked in Kruger. And while I spent a lot of time in Kruger as a kid, I haven't spent much time in Kruger in the last 20 or 30, in fact, no, 30 years. So, I can't speak of Kruger. Now, it, it's sometimes confusing for people when we separate discussions between Kruger, or discussions of Kruger and Sabi Sand. And when we do separate those kind of discussions, it's mostly about us human beings, because when it comes to animals, we can't separate the two because the, 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 it's all one area for the animals. The Kruger is a national park, it's a, it's, it's a government national park open to the public. This is a private reserve only open to private landowners and the guests that are booked into the lodges. This is not a park that people can come to and just drive around and see the animals unless you're booked in at one of the game lodges and then you go out with one of the guides. And it's the very fact that there are a lot of lodges and there is a huge network of roads in here in the Sabi Sand that preclude this area from being used by poachers because of this network of roads. Poachers are going to see the... They, well, it's not only they're going to see, they know. Before they even come here, they know that this is not an area that they can come to because they can be found so easily. Um, and not to say that there haven't been odd people that have come through the Sabi Sand and sort of petty theft um, incidents have occurred in the lodges. One finds at full moon people will come in from the outside, not often, once in a blue moon maybe, been incidents of people coming in over a full moon. We had uh, Conrad who does the anti-poaching and security for the Sabi Sand came by today and said he found tracks and even though it's not a full moon, it's actually a new moon. There were tracks today leading in towards Buyatello of some strangers. But they wouldn't be poachers because poachers need time and secrecy. And with the network of roads that we have, a poacher will see that the roads are used frequently by the amount of vehicle tracks that they find on these roads. So they're not going to even attempt to do anything. And it's that very fact that means that we don't really bump into poachers at all. In all my years of, of guiding here in South Africa, and running camps, I have yet to bump into poachers in the private reserves. We've had, in the 1980s and early 90s, we used to have a lot of Mozambique refugees that came through. And we actually, we had this little corridor that we helped them get through to the area on the western side of Kruger called Gazankulu, where there were people that would shelter them. And of course, when the government found them, they would send them back to Mozambique. But they weren't poachers, they were just people look, looking for freedom. And even in the 80s, before our previous government came to an end, there were still people coming in from Mozambique wanting to live in a free country. And it was a lot more free than Mozambique was. It was civil war and anarchy in Mozambique at the time. But I can't say that we've had any incidents of poaching. Oh, we found snares. I have on walks found bits of wire snares. Uh, in my history of wildlife or being with wildlife I've had occasion to actually be involved in darting animals or bringing in the state veterinarian and darting animals to remove snares and to assist those animals in recovery because of snares and the kind of poaching that goes on around the edges of the reserve for meat and for subsistence but, you know, kind of what we call subsistence poaching hungry people trying to feed a family 
But the serious poaching, poaching for financial gain, poaching for elephant tusk and rhino horn. That is the serious type of poaching that we won't, we don't get here. And as sad as it is that it is on an increase in Kruger, there's not much that we can do about it from this part of the world. As far as what we would do with a poacher is concerned, if we could, we would do a citizen's arrest and we'd bring in the authorities to take over, if it came to that. There wouldn't be much else that we can do. Um, some of them are armed. Most of them are armed in Kruger. They're shooting rhino. And while I'm brave with wildlife, I'm bra I can, I'll walk with lion, I'll stand down an elephant. I can't say that I fear anything in this environment because I'm, my passion for it runs too deep and my knowledge for it is relatively good. I am deathly afraid of human beings with weapons. And if I was to come across poachers with weapons, I would probably not be able to do anything about it. Since I don't carry a weapon, I don't believe in weapons. And one of the harshest things that I can see in my lifetime is adults buying children toy guns. And if I could, I would start a movement to ban toy guns from toy shops. And then people give me the argument, yeah, but then I'll just get a stick and pretend it's a gun. I don't care if kids take a stick and pretend it's a gun. It's just the concept of having these really realistic looking guns in toy shops that breed this gun culture that we have in the world today. Anyway, that's a huge, wholly different story. So we're coming up to the area now, change the subject, thankfully where those elephants may have crossed this road after this dip. Looking forward to that. facing the wrong way to see tracks. I've got the sun behind me which makes it very difficult to see any tracks in front of me. So I've got to look down. What I'm looking at is I'm looking into this, the light of the track instead of looking into the shadow of it which is vital in terms of tracking. But somewhere here will be some elephant tracks Ten-year-old Dylan. Hello, Dylan. Nice to have you with us today. Eleven went up here. Looks like they came up here. Some of them headed straight in here. Dylan, how tall do elephants get? How tall is an elephant? Uh, probably about 11, 10, 11 feet at the shoulder for a big male. I'd say maybe 12 feet for a very big one. I'm gonna just drive up here a little bit to see if they, they might still be close by. I doubt it, but if it's, if I've got a fairly open path to get into this bush, we'll go and have a look. And then I can maybe stand on a termite mound and listen. Otherwise, the other alternative is to go to another part of the reserve and look for something else and come back a little later, just in case they have moved closer to a road, like this was a cut line or something.
Dylan, if you stood on a basketball player's shoulders, you might be about eye level with the shoulder of an elephant. Pop it into low range. our way through the trees Many times in the past, the elephants have come this way from the dam, and sometimes we find them on Gary Cutline Central Road Junction around there. Sometimes we just never find them. And I think today I'm just taking a chance. It's starting to get a little bit thick, but maybe I can still find a few gaps to get through here. Termite mound, perhaps I can climb the top of this termite mound. Let's see if I can see an ear, whoops, an ear flapping in the distance somewhere, or hear a branch break. I'll be back in a second.
we seem to be on the spot where they sit, where they've walked through. There are a couple of paths here where some grass is flattened, and you can see the, or I can rather, I can see where the grasses have been flattened into the sand, making that impression of the grasses more than elephant tracks themselves. Still heading east. I don't know if we're going to still be able to do that. Getting quite thick here. Might be an idea to go back to Gauri Cutline and head west. But I couldn't hear a thing other than the odd go away bird. Yes, okay, that's how I get rid of, rid of Oscar's voice. Take my earpiece out. No, it takes me time sometimes to put it back in. That's interesting. When I was on top of the termite mine, Oscar says that could hear my feet moving in the grass. It's not very easy to stand on that particular termite mound. There's nothing level up at the top there, just these few little peaks, these little points sticking up. Okay. No, I hear this. I hear you. Yeah, good idea. Next time I'm doing that I can still talk to you. Because the internal mic of the camera is still picking up sound, it's a good thing. So now it's a matter of getting back to Mbubu Road. Sticking to these little open patches of grass. up underneath us, after us. I think it's called a goat moth. Goat beard moth. Something. Maybe you can see this. I don't know if I can find it, but on the other side of this branch, you can see where this caterpillar has been eating the bark. It's living in a hole. It's living in this tunnel, just underneath, sort of a hollow that is made just where my finger's popping out now. I'm trying to keep this still, I mean, the elasticity of this branch is pretty amazing. I could probably do some exercises with it. But as this caterpillar eats and it defecates, it uses its, its little pellets and it sews them together to form a tube that runs, that runs down to where it's hiding probably, unless it's somewhere here at the end. I can almost see through it, but I'm not seeing the caterpillar on this end. But you can see how oh there it's lifted now. Not serious. You sometimes get aggregations of these caterpillars. They don't have a very pretty moth when they get in when they turn into a moth. Don't think I've got my book here. But I must have a look at Dave Hill's butterfly book. It'll give us maybe an, a good example if there are moths in there. But there's something that one doesn't really notice.
trying to think of the name of the caterpillar I've got. There's some reference to goat beard or goat or something in that, something in that line. Jet flying over. Maybe it's a Gulf Stream. I think it's most of me. Or Mala Mala. Scucuza. Maybe that airport in Scucuza is still operational. Sounds worse than it is. Dead twigs underneath the vehicles cleaning the undercarriage. <laughs> 